Overcoming by Pure Voice Girl. Chapter 50. The Dimmons were the first to leave that evening, having fully enjoyed their renewed contact with Hartford and promising to be much underfoot in the future. In pairs and small parties, Will and Hannibal bid farewell to their guests in grandfather's stead, until only Lord and Lady Miskinis remained. They shared a small, delightful late dinner with them, during which Uncle Thomas teased Hannibal mercilessly about the lures, using English for Will's sake. "'And will Lady Lathmore not join us for a little drink before bedtime?' Aunt Aldana inquired, sitting back as the servants smoothly removed the plates and cleared the table for brandies. "'Unfortunately, she is still unwell.' Will said, sipping his drink with great respect for his stomach. For a terrifying moment during the eel soup starter, he feared he might have to flee the room to spare himself. The scent was so overpowering. She also tends to sleep very late, so I doubt you will see her before you depart. Must you leave so early? I have some things to take care of in your capital before we leave for home, Uncle Thomas said, leaning closer for Hannibal to light his cigar for him. We are cutting our time somewhat close, as you say. The strait is very temperamental this time of year. It is not so easy to travel safely. I would never sacrifice your safety. However pleasant I find your company, Will said, waving away the smoke in what he hoped was a surreptitious gesture. You must write when you return to the capital. We could host you at Chelsea House and attend the opera. You darling child, Aunt Aldana crooned, reaching out to pat Will's cheek. You will not be doing any of that soon. Will didn't know what to make of that statement, and a glance at Hannibal showed him that his husband hadn't heard her response. Before he could ask for clarification, she said, Very obscurt me upstairs, Will. I am very tired. Of course, he said, rising as she did, relieved to escape the cloying scent of smoke and the stubborn smells of their meal. Hannibal and Uncle Thomas rose as well, but Aunt Aldana gestured them to sit, saying, No, no, you sit down, take your time to catch up. I only wish we could have stayed a little longer. So do I. Hannibal said, moving to grasp her hands in his and place a light kiss on her cheek. Good night, Aunt Aldana. His vibrant amber eyes lit on Will, and he pressed a lingering kiss to his knuckles in parting, whispering, I'll join you soon. Will blushed when he glanced at Uncle Thomas and caught him winking at Aunt Aldana, and he hastily tugged his hand free. A good night to you both, he said, offering his arm to Lady Miskinis, which she accepted with a small smile. Forgive me for separating you from the gentleman she said, strolling at Will's side, with her arm looped through his. She was as tall as he was, slender and graceful as a willow with. Only you look a little tired to me, little strained. I am a little tired, Will admitted, his free hand firmly on the banister as they took the stairs. Contentment is sapping my energy, I fear. I was never so easily fatigued before Hannibal's return. I could not tell you how it relieves me to see him so happy with you, Will. She said, angling a fond smile at him, that Will easily returned. I had begun to lose hope that he would ever find anyone to wear his mother's ring. I had begun to lose hope that he would ever be happy, but I can see for myself how happy he is. And how happy you are. Will grinned, the pink in his cheeks returning for an encore, and he said, We make one another very happy, Lady Miskinis. You must call me Aunt Aldana, she insisted, tugging on his arm. We are family, after all. Thank you, Aunt Aldana, for speaking so candidly with me today, Will said, turning carefully on the landing toward her suite. It cheers me to think that Hannibal's life took such a turn for the better once you all were allowed to be a part of it. Thank you for taking such good care of him all those summers. The only thing that hurt our family worse than Sal's death was being kept from her son, Aunt Aldana sighed, squeezing his fingers. They slowed to a stop at her door, and she turned to face him, serene and smiling. But we were overjoyed when his grace allowed us to keep him at last. It was our joy to show Hannibal his mother's home, just as it would be our joy to show the child you carry. Will cocked his head and said with a bewildered smile, I'm sorry, Aunt Aldana, I'm, I'm not yet pregnant. I'm not even certain I can even bear Hannibal's children. Oh? She said, her dark brows rising over her dancing dark eyes, and her lips curving into an indulgent smile. Perhaps I am mistaken. I am older now, and not so good at guessing as I used to be. I will keep that in mind when we partner at cards, Will said, delighted when she laughed at his light teasing. He kissed her hands and released them, saying, 
sleep well. I shall be sure to be there to see you off come morning. Good night, child, Aunt Aldana said, and let herself into her room. Will turned back down the hallway towards his suite, lost in thought and curious. He absently rubbed his stomach, wondering if his recent sickness and sensitivity to scent might be something more than just Mina's god's awful tea, or his medicines wearing off. He tried to find anything different, any small indication that there was a life growing within him, but there was no bolt of revelation, no awareness, just a soft sense of contentment that grew with every breath. It was almost too much to hope for, and as much faith as Hannibal had given him in hope, he still feared to tempt his own disappointment with such a fantasy. "'It will come when it comes, if it's meant to,' he breathed, letting himself into his suite to find Jimmy readying his bed and Winston already in his basket. "'I didn't expect you up so soon!' Jimmy said, smoothing the covers one last time and following Will into his dressing room. "'Lady Miskinis was tired. They have an early start of it tomorrow,' Will said, deftly undoing his buttons as he spoke. "'If I'm not up when they stir, please wake me, Jimmy.' "'My lord, you're up before the sun itself stirs,' Jimmy reminded him, easing Will's jacket off and laying it aside. "'I've been so tired recently. I feel as if I could nap all the time.' Will confided, holding still for Jimmy to divest him of his pocket watch, cufflinks, and pin. "'Don't worry, my lord,' Jimmy said, plopping everything to one side to be dealt with after Will was dressed. "'It will pass.' "'I hope so,' Will said, shedding the rest of his clothes and shivering a little as the cool air kissed his skin. "'Has Miss Speck said how Mina's doing?' "'She had a dinner tray just after you went into the dining room,' Jimmy said, dropping Will's nightshirt over his head and tugging it to fall over him. Other than that, she says Lady Rathmore has done nothing but write letters. An interesting thing to do when one is stricken with a headache, Will said, oddly annoyed. He stepped into his pants and fastened them himself, sliding his feet into his slippers while Jimmy swept his robe up. I'll check on her in the morning. Is there anything I can get for you? I can have a tray off before you can snap your fingers if you'd like a snack before bed, Jimmy offered, tugging the robe around him and tying it snugly at his waist. You've been eating so little recently, my lord. I'm starting to worry about you. It's nothing's, just my suppressants wearing off, Will said, wrinkling his nose a little. It seems like everything smells so strong, I can hardly stand it. Mm-hmm, Jimmy said, gazing at him as if he knew something Will didn't. And uh, why would you think that? Uh, because of the side effects, Will said, putting the same reasoning to his valet as he had to Hannibal. They must have blunted my sense of smell, I think. I shouldn't have taken those things to begin with, I suppose. Have you felt achy at all? Jimmy asked, his nonchalance not fooling Will in the least. Yes, Will said, watching him prepare his discarded clothing for washing and tending. Why? No reason. I just noticed you rub your stomach quite a lot recently, Jimmy said, bundling it all up on his arm. He turned back to Will with a bright, cheery smile and asked, Should I bring you a tray of some toast and pudding? No, thank you. Will said, wryly realizing his valet had decided against speaking plainly to him. I think I'll just read for a while and go to bed. Tell Mr. Berger not to wait up. There's no telling how late Hannibal will be. He's having brandy with Lord Miskinis. I will be sure to tell him. He left a little something for Lord Clarges in his suite as a surprise, so he'll be glad not to catch him tonight. Oh dear, that sounds rather devious of him, Will said, putting his spectacles on and glancing around for his book. He almost asked Jimmy if he'd seen it before he recalled taking it to Hannibal's room. "'Good night, Jimmy. Be sure to get some rest.' "'Good night, my lord,' Jimmy called after him as Will moved through the dark washroom into Hannibal's suite. Winston stuck like a burr to his side. The book was right where Will had left it, sitting on Hannibal's vanity, neatly swept to one side out of the way for tidying. And situated prominently next to it was another frame of Will's lures." Will grinned, laughing softly to himself, to think of Mr. Berger sneaking a frame upstairs to leave on Hannibal's vanity. "'My husband is lucky I don't anger quickly,' Will said to Winston, the dog's ears perking with interest at the sound of his voice. He brandished the frame for emphasis, and Winston cocked his head, desperate to understand. "'This is so typically Alpha, honestly!' He lowered the frame, looking at what Hannibal had selected. They were not the most beautiful of the lures he'd made, but the most interesting, the most complex, the most taxing. He hadn't taken them blindly or without purpose, and Will could very easily envision him looking them over with care, 
plucking down the ones that appealed to him, all to put on display for guests in their home, a proud Alpha eager to share his mate's talents with the world. Well, Will said, putting the frame down and plucking up his book. He isn't getting off that easily, is he? He patted his thigh to call Winston, intending to return to his own room, but Winston jumped up on the bed and got settled, head on paws, eyes doleful. Traitor, Will breathed, smirking. He moved to stroke the dog's head, ruffling his soft ears and sighed. I suppose we can sleep in here tonight, hm? Hannibal can have the Duchess suite. Berger had turned the bed down already, and Will made himself comfortable, propping up against the pillows with the lamp turned high. He opened to his bookmark and began to read, but found that Mr. Eustace Ballard's dry, moralistic writing didn't hold the same appeal as it had before. When he'd been lost and searching desperately for confirmation that his unhappiness was for the greater good, Mr. Ballard's teaching had offered understanding and resignation. Now, now, with so much happiness in his life, with the future he'd once hoped for inexplicably his present, an instruction for gentlemen was as dull, dry, and tiresome as a chapel day sermon. He was rescued from his boredom by the unexpected approach of his husband, a faint thrum through his bond that grew with anticipation. His heart picked up its pace and a smile teased his lips, a helpless response to his husband's impending arrival. The tread of footsteps was even and swift, the confident stride of an alpha happily content with his life. Will could hear him humming even before he opened the door, and bit his lower lip against a smile when he recognized the melody of his lullaby. Will! Hannibal paused in the doorway for a moment, surprised to find his mate curled up in his bed. Winston bolted down to greet him, tail wagging, jumping in his excitement. Hannibal hastily closed the door behind him and calmed the excited little dog, but he had eyes only for his husband. I can't tell you how much pleasure it gives me to see you this way. Reading, Will inquired, tipping a look at Hannibal over the top of his spectacles. In my bed, Hannibal corrected, grinning. He shooed Winston with a gesture, straightening to drink in the sight of his mate in such relaxed repose, pink-cheeked and pleasantly rumpled in his fine nightclothes. "'It was Winston's idea,' Will said, liquid pleasure sliding through him from his bond, the proud delight of an alpha smitten to the core with his mate. "'I'd left my book in here and came to collect it. Winston decided we should stay.' "'Thank you, Winston,' Hannibal said, patting the bed and roughing Winston's jaws, when he leapt back up at Will's feet. "'Very good boy.' "'I told him you could have the Duchess suite.' Will primly informed him, turning the page with feigned nonchalance. "'Oh, dear,' Hannibal said, searching Will's expression for signs that he was teasing. "'I take it you didn't enjoy my surprise.' He moved to his dressing room already shedding his clothes, leaving the door standing wide behind him. "'And what part was I meant to enjoy?' Will called after him, tasting the air for Hannibal's rich alpha scent." It flowed through his senses like rich honey, thick enough to drown in, to wrap round himself like a blanket. The part where you went up to my workroom and poked around without permission? Or was the part where you removed my lures without asking, framed them, and then deposited them all over the house without my knowing of it? Well, Hannibal said, emerging from his dressing room after a long, considering silence. When you put it that way, I can see why you'd be irritated. How generous of you. Will said, jerking his gaze back to his book, to pretend rapt absorption when he saw Hannibal was wearing nothing more than his light sleeping pants, no robe in sight. Isn't it? Hannibal asked, sounding so pleased with himself that Will almost laughed. I'm left with no choice, I suppose. Will tipped his chin up to cock a disapproving eyebrow Hannibal's way, losing his battle with a reluctant smile when his husband patted his belly and said, I shall have to seduce you with my masculine charms once more. Because it worked so well last time, Will asked, warning him. Don't think you can distract me with your chest hair, Hannibal Lecter. It was badly done of you, you know. It was, Hannibal said, sitting down at the foot of the bed opposite Winston and pulling Will's foot into his lap. He worked both thumbs expertly up Will's arch, his warm hands and long fingers soothing and firm. I will gladly apologize for invading your privacy, Will. I went up to the attic seeking some sign of your presence here in the house, and I found them so beautiful it seemed a shame to keep them hidden away. Will poked his nose into his book, toes curling with every stroke of Hannibal's fingers. Some men's spouses paint watercolors, 
Hannibal murmured, working the pad of his foot. Mine makes excellent lures. The better to land you with, Hannibal. As if you've ever needed anything other than that mind of yours. Hannibal purred, lifting Will's foot to kiss the turn of his ankle. Shame on you, Will said, nudging him with his toes. You need permission to go into people's private places. I always have permission before entering any of your private places, Hannibal said, grinning when Will's cheeks bloomed pink. Ah, I see you found Mr. Ballard's grim proselytizing on the benefits of austerity. I seem to recall you once said my boring kisses couldn't hold a candle to that torturous tome. Your kisses are far from boring, and this is not a torturous tome, Will said, compelled to defend the book he'd grown up with. I still contest the outcome of the wager, by the way. Startling the life out of me by bursting into my room unannounced is not distracting me with your lovemaking. I had to win somehow, Hannibal said, tugging on the spine so that Will met his eyes. What hope had I against Mr. Ballard? He leaned close and kissed Will's lips, a tingling, teasing plum of his tongue drawing Will's lower lip between his for a soft suck. Is this part of your apology? Will murmured, tipping his head back with a smile. Or are you wheedling me with your masculine charms? Neither, sadly. He pushed to his feet, drawing his hand down Will's hip and thigh in a lingering caress as he rounded the bed for his writing desk. You're writing letters at this hour? Will asked, his own disappointment surprising him. I'm sending some letters of intent with Uncle Tomas, Hannibal said, settling at his desk and pulling his writing things within reach. He says he knows of a way to get suppressants to the front and is happy to help us in any way possible. That is very good news, Will said, settling back and rubbing his foot against Winston's flank. With the ships tied up by the military, I was considering leasing a vessel from the north. Even if we have to ship the freight to them over land, at least it will sail without restriction. Hannibal paused, gracing his husband with a proud smile. You are terribly clever. Don't get any ideas, Will warned, motioning to his quill. Perhaps between us and your Uncle Thomas we can at least get some stopgap measures in place. But the situation is going to require legal action on their behalf. Uncle Tomas carries a good deal of weight at court, both here and in Latuva. He says he can confidently vouch their support if we apply to the court system for a resolution. These soldiers have fought for our country. They should not be punished for that. And I know their majesties could hardly argue that point. He's encouraged me to petition the king, and I will do so, with grandfather's permission, of course. You know you have a lovely family, Hannibal, Will said, thinking of Aunt Aldana and what Cyrus had said to her. He couldn't bring himself to speak it aloud, to even ask if Hannibal knew of his father's suspicions. He was already so hurt by his past, wounded in ways Will still didn't know the half of, that it seemed cruel to mention it. There was no doubt in his mind, or in anyone's mind for that matter, that Hannibal was indeed his father's son, no matter the doubt Cyrus may have held. I do hope we'll see more of them. We can see as much or as little of any of them as you'd like. Hannibal said, working swiftly. They certainly dote on you, and I know my grandparents would love to meet you. Will looked over at him, his heart skipping a beat. It felt unreal for a moment, as if being here in Hannibal's bed, happy and content, was a dream he might suddenly wake from. Do you think this is how it will always be now? He asked, trailing his gaze over Hannibal's strong shoulders, watching the muscles in his forearm play beneath his skin as he wrote. Days spent rediscovering old friends, and lounging around Hartford with untold legions of my relations threatening us with recollections of my childhood. Hannibal asked, one brow quirking, the light catching his amber eyes and filling them with sparkling gold. Gods, I hope not. He grinned and Will chuckled, amused. We are neither of us used to idleness, Will, Hannibal said, putting his closing sentiments on the first letter and laying it aside to act as the template for the others. This is a reprieve, not a warning of days to come, my love. The offhand endearment caught Will by surprise, rare as it was, pleasing him even more because Hannibal didn't realize he'd said it. Now that everyone has gone and the house is set back to rights, you and I can go down to Hartford Town and begin looking at locations, Hannibal said, making quick work of the other letters, eager to be finished and join his mate in bed. For your practice, Will said, excited by even the thought of it. Or for the hospital. Practice first, Hannibal said, blotting the ink. I'll rely on you a great deal, Will. I do hope you'll wish to be a part of it. I look forward to it.
will said returning to his book to allow hannibal to finish his letters in peace it was impossible to concentrate on the words when his husband was infinitely more interesting to him than the pious mr eustace ballard however he amused himself instead with rubbing winston's belly with his toes chuckling and twitching his foot back when the dog happily gave the sole of his foot a swipe with his tongue winston don't that tickles he took no notice of the considering look hannibal sent his way nor of the way that look shifted to the quill in his hand before he signed the last letter when hannibal was finished he moved through his room putting out all the lamps but the one will was reading by he slid onto the bed at will's side and got settled brushing his fingers down will's arm in a tickling touch will shiver dropping his book against his chest to look at his husband he noticed the clean quill hannibal held and asked what are you up to hannibal hannibal tickled his snub nose with the tip of the feather and said arming myself you have your knees and your fascinating mr ballard while well, i have only my chest hair and your belly will whispered cupping his hand over hannibal's stomach to squeeze him a light shiver coursing through him his eyes swept closed when the feather trailed over his cheek and down his lips the tickling touch strangely arousing his nerves stretched with anticipation Hannibal's presence a go to the desire that welled up within him, always ready and responsive to his touch. When he spoke, the words were an amused, soft murmur. "'What are you doing?' "'What does it matter to you?' Hannibal asked, one brow lifting when Will's eyes flew open to fasten on his. "'I cannot distract you from your book, can I?' Will's mouth slowly curled into a smile, baring his sharp little Omegan fangs. "'Is that a challenge, Hannibal?' I think it just might be. Hannibal purred, delighted when Will made a show of returning to his book, doing his best to ignore the brush of fingers down his thigh, trailing over the slope of muscle in a light caress. The fine linen pants he liked to wear to bed were too thin to be much of a shield between them, even if Will wore them like armor instead. Hannibal caught the hem of Will's nightshirt and pushed it higher, until he bared the smooth skin of his belly, taut and warm. The flick of the feather tracing the hem of his pants from hip to hip woke a shiver down Will's spine. He studiously didn't look, knowing that he'd toss the book away in a heartbeat in exchange for Hannibal's kisses, knowing he could give as good as he would get and they would both be the happier for it. His awareness focused down on the brush of that feather tracing idle patterns on the fluttering expanse of his belly, waking nerve endings with every light caress. Hannibal shifted down his body, sliding the feather along Will's skin to watch it jump and twitch in response. He couldn't resist the chance to lay a kiss on the smooth skin of his hip, right at the knob of bone, just there above the lip of his pants. He pressed his sharp, dangerous teeth there and bit him gently. Will's breath hitched audibly, and he tugged the book up closer to his face, hiding his expression behind the sanctimonious lectures of Mr. Ballard, every nerve in his body tuned to Hannibal's touch. Hannibal trailed the feather over to his belly button, dipping the tip into the dimple with tickling intent that made Will squirm, losing track of the words before him again. He stifled a moan when the feather was followed by Hannibal's hot tongue and the sharp graze of teeth across tender skin. The soft, loving kiss that followed brought tears to his eyes, placed as it was over his womb, the whisper of Hannibal's words unintelligible against his skin. Perhaps... Hannibal murmured, sitting up to bunch Will's nightshirt higher, tugging it from him, first one arm, then the other, around the obstacle of the book. You should read aloud to me. Will tipped the book down, asking, Tit for tat. You play for me, I read for you. How else am I to be certain you're properly distracted? Hannibal asked, tossing the nightshirt aside as Will eased back down, the curves of his plump chest and the long line of his graceful body softened by shadows and lamplight. Shall we refine our terms? If I can distract you from reading aloud, then I win. Even though you've already won, Will pressed, settling the book back down on his chest, the open cover hiding him. I would win properly, Hannibal corrected, sliding the book to one side to better see him. Will grasped it, holding it up with one hand, his blue eyes straying to the feather where it lay at his side. Hannibal plucked it up, barely touching the soft edge against the smooth planes of Will's belly. He traced a meandering trail up Will's body, sliding it around the gentle curve of one breast, in swirling circles, drawing closer and closer to his tightening nipple. He flicked the tender little nub with the barest tip, and Will moaned, eyes slitting nearly closed, as Hannibal teased him with that feather. 
The brushing touch was too light to do anything more than prickle his senses, promising greater pleasures to be had at his hands and lips and teeth. You're more sensitive than usual, Hannibal whispered, the feather drifting to the other side to tease Will's opposite nipple to flushed stiffness. Are you distracted yet? No, Will purred, shoulders relaxing, the tilt of his body putting his chest on display for Hannibal's awed, enraptured gaze. The feather traced the curve of his lips and the stubborn tuck of his chin, flicking down beneath his jaw to brush over the mark Hannibal had left on him. Will stretched beneath the touch and turned his head, the sensitive scar responsive to the light play of the feather over it. You are the most beautiful person I've ever known, Hannibal murmured, his eyes fastened to the feather as he traced the cords of Will's long neck, swept the hollow of his throat, and the thin skin stretching over his sternum. The blue veins beneath the surface of his rosy skin were more prominent, a faint tracery of his life's blood that Hannibal followed with the feather's tip. His physician's mind catalogued it, but Hannibal resisted being self-indulgent in his wishful thinking. Only time would tell the truth of things, and for now, he would treasure and pamper and tease and love this amazing Omega with everything in him. Hannibal shifted to straddle him, deliberately settling over Will's heated groin, smirking to feel the responsive twitch he won. It must be terribly absorbing, Mr. Ballard's book. I would say that it is not, Will told him, albeit rather breathlessly. But I wouldn't wish to poke holes in your ego. Hannibal chuckled at that, delighted, relentlessly flicking one nipple with the feather, until both peaks hardened even more, perked and straining and reddened from the flush of his blood. Is that you poking at my ego just now? Hannibal asked, feeling the sudden surge in Will's sex when he slowed to a gentle rub, his free hand braced on the bed at Will's side to ease the burden of his weight. You know there are ways we could manage, if you're interested. I think we've... Manage rather well to now, don't you? Will breathed, gasping when the feather dipped down to play over his ribs, his skin tight and tingling. I wouldn't be opposed to seeing how well I play the Omega, and you the Alpha. Hannibal purred, letting his weight rest just a shade more over Will's heated groin. I'm curious what it would be like. It seems a shame to let your ample endowments suffer a lack. Will turned a satisfying shade of bright pink and raised his book, draping it over his flushed face to avoid both Hannibal's assessing gaze as well as answering him. Hannibal chuckled, amused by his response, and stretched over Will to kiss his way up, drawing one fat, taut nipple into his mouth with care. Even the gentlest suck made Will tighten, his body tensing as if for impact. Hannibal eased back, gently teasing it with his tongue instead, careful with him. His touch was tender when he cupped Will's other breast, the brush of his thumb light against sensitive skin. He worried Will's hypersensitivity might make things too uncomfortable to continue on, but when he drew back, Will pushed forward. "'You haven't distracted me yet, Lord Clarges. Will breathed, biting his lip when Hannibal resumed the light, teasing touches that went straight to his groin. He was wet and ready, his swollen sex trapped beneath the weight of Hannibal's body straddling him. His mind strayed to his husband's suggestion, and it left him unprepared for the soft rasp of his teeth. It brought a shock that made Will's eyes momentarily blur with pleasure. It was so unexpected. His mouth parted on a soft gasp, and he wriggled, belatedly trying to hide the movement under the guise of getting more comfortable. Certainly is a shame. Hannibal breathed, his hot breath puffing over Will's taut nipple, now dark and fully erect, delightfully large and inviting. That I cannot distract you. He coiled up to kiss him, pushing the book aside, his hand tangling in Will's curls as he cupped his face. His mate opened to him, wet and inviting, the same lips that whispered to him of love, the same lips that wrapped so eagerly around his hard body to bring him pleasure. His wondrous mate, taciturn and teasing by turns, infinitely fascinating, confoundingly complicated in some ways, and surprisingly simple in others. God's how I love you, Will. He breathed, sighing the words into his mouth, whispering them against his soft tongue and sharp teeth, as if feeding Will his love bite by tender bite. Will was painfully hard beneath him, pressed up beneath Hannibal's full sack, his heat easily felt through the light pants they both wore. Hannibal knew it might take some time to bring his mate around to the idea, but he'd been honest when he said he was curious. He'd never push if Will said not to. 
All it would ever take was a single word. But he'd made the suggestion, and knew his husband would give it the benefit of his curiosity. Well, he said, coiling his tongue out to trace the fullness of his lower lip. I think I may have distracted you. You're getting there, Will whispered, his lax fingers tightening on the book. He pushed Hannibal up with his free hand and rolled beneath him to prop the book on the pillows. Feeling somewhat victorious to have his obvious weakness hidden, he cleared his throat and began to read in a voice that was not exactly steady or calm. If a man is to be truly a gentleman, he must be an exemplary example of forthright, stalwart trustworthiness to those around him, he read, pushing his sensitive chest hard against the fine sheets to keep the material from bothering him though he throbbed with the lingering touch of Hannibal's mouth and fingers and that damned feather. One cannot be seen as a man who breaks his bond and to ma maintain a position of strength. One must have principles. His words stuttered when Hannibal swept his hands up Will's scarred back. A moment later, the feather traced down the dip of his spine and up again, chasing a shiver that Will couldn't restrain. He closed his eyes, shuddering as Hannibal traced the marks on his skin, finding the bloom of nerves and teasing them to life in what must surely seem a barren field of horror. But he didn't see it as such, by the way he touched Will, nor had he ever. He slowly dragged the feather over Will's skin, watching goose flesh dimple up where it was smooth. He traced each ridge and knot of scar tissue, lips and tongues following the feather tip. Hannibal, Will whispered the fine hairs on his nape rising, the sensations so keen he could hardly focus. Even though Hannibal had never shied away, had always accepted those scars as simply part of the Omega he loved, Will felt compelled to offer. You don't have to. You say that as if I shouldn't. Hannibal purred, sliding his mouth over to nip Will just beneath the wing of his shoulder, his breath spilling in a hot wave beneath Will's arm. Shall I tell you what I see? He sat back, weight-pressing Will's hips into the bed as he settled down on his bottom. His warm, calloused hands cupped Will's neck and swept down as he purred. Broad shoulders like ivory, delicate yet strong. His fingers dipped into the hollows of Will's arms, a brief tickling touch before they spread over his sides. The graceful curve of a waist I could spend an entirety caressing. The touch trailed to the small of Will's back, Hannibal's thumb pressing against his spine and rubbing upwards. The bend of your spine flowing beneath your skin in a rise and spill of bone. Strong enough to bear the weight of your pain, but so fragile all the same. He tipped forward, pressing a sucking kiss to Will's nape. But when I touch you, when I watch your skin move beneath my fingers, and hear the tiny catch in your breath, when I taste your skin with the sweet scent of you filling my senses, what I seek to please is not made of this flesh. It's merely housed by it. Will shivered, tipping his head to pull his muscles tight beneath the kiss that trailed over his shoulder. You say I don't have to. I say I do. My desire for you takes many forms, Will, none of them more important than the other. But in every way, I am greedy for you entirely. Will's eyes flew wide when Hannibal's weight suddenly lifted off his backside. He was still lost in the sensual delight of his husband's words, unprepared to have his pants tugged down and off. He looked back over his shoulder with one brow raised, grinning when he found his husband taking a critical look at his backside. Don't mind me, Hannibal murmured, admiring the view of his mate's delectable bottom mounded over the perfect tuck of his waist. Or am I distracting you? It is only that I do not usually read in the nude, Lord Clarges, Will said, making a show of returning to his book. And if it shifted the long length of his back, why then turnabout was fair play. I would not say that I am distracted. No, indeed, Hannibal said, feeling pleasantly satisfied just looking from Will's curly dark hair down his slender pale body to his curled little toes. His little slit was hidden by the taut curves of his round cheeks, but Hannibal knew he would find him there, that modest little opening slick and willing to be explored. Please, Will, continue with your reading. The movement of sliding Will's pants off of him had pulled his hard sex flat to the bed, a firm and enticing jut of flesh just there between his pale thighs. Hannibal plucked up the feather from where it had fallen aside, anticipation and desire making him tremble. His pride in his mate nearly overcame him, 
and he was once more struck with awe that such a surprising and inspiring personality could be housed in such a perfect form. "'One must have principles,' Will read, shivering softly at the gliding brush of the feather up his calves, the lingering circles drawing in the hollows of his knees. It was difficult to concentrate on the pious text before him, with his husband so determined to distract him. But Will wasn't about to let him win so easily— so he found his place and began again. Fidelity to one's purpose is the first step in maintaining solid principles. The feather slipped over the curve of his bottom, prickling his skin with anticipation as it skated downward, a slow, almost painful drag against his eager flesh. One can never argue from a point of weakness, Will said, his breath escaping on a harsh gasp when Hannibal flicked the feather over the soft bulge of his member, sweeping it long ways over his smooth skin. The world narrowed to that touch, the blood rushing from his head in eager anticipation, flooding his skin with a flush of color that made him more sensitive still. Hannibal paused for a moment, struggling to control himself, the sight of Will so aroused beneath him almost too much to bear. His clothes felt unpleasantly scratchy, an encumbrance between himself and the smooth heat of his precious mate. He ached to stretch over him and push deep, but he restrained himself, his desire to bring Will pleasure outweighing the needs of his own aching flesh. He dragged the tip of the feather lower, in a teasing, light brush, and Will tensed, breathless with anticipation. The bare, grazing touch drifted down the length of Will's ruddy sex, flicking his swollen head as if by accident. Will's belly pressed into the bed and his back arched, his haunches tightening, a blissful, throaty moan dragged out of him. The blossom of pleasure flared beneath the tickling, teasing caress of the soft feather against him, his slender body racked with shudders. Hannibal drew a shaky breath, swirling the tip of the feather against the sensitive head of Will's sex, and asked in a broken, husky murmur, "'You're saying?' Will wiggled, uttering a low, keening moan as he sought more friction than the soft feather could give him. It took him a long moment to gather himself— to drag his concentration from the light touch of that feather, brushing over the insides of his thighs, down the twitching length of his painfully eager sex. "'One can never argue from a point of weakness,' Will read, finding himself in just such a position at present. "'Always be in full possession of the facts as they present themselves, and at no point allow any one of them to escape your uh, attention.' Will squirmed beneath him, until Hannibal couldn't bear it a second longer. He flung the quill to the floor, listening to the soft, raspy music of Will's voice as he reined himself in. He spread his palms over the heft of Will's backside, weighing his warm flesh with an appreciative purr before giving both silky globes a lusty squeeze. The pressure of his hands parted them slightly, giving him a delightful glimpse of Will's slick slit and virginal anus, which had the most peculiar effect on Hannibal's own vivid imagination yet again. May maintain truth in all exchanges. C consider objectively all protest to your position and prepare to defend your stance with humility and faith, Will said, his voice rising slightly when he felt Hannibal's thumb slide between his cheeks to open him up. He tried to pull his thighs together, but he couldn't, not with his husband there between his legs. Heart pounding with anticipation, Will turned the page with a hand that trembled, his fingers fumbling the page. A gentleman's staunch defense of his purpose will inspire those about him to reconsider their own purpose! He ended the sentence on a high-pitched yelp when hot breath poured down the cleft of his backside, quickly followed by the wet prod of Hannibal's heated tongue, tracing the slight rise of flesh where his sack narrowed to cradle his slit. "'Are you reconsidering your purpose, Will?' Hannibal asked, his voice husky. He nibbled softly at the wet, soft entrance of Will's body, tasting the thick flavor of arousal moistening those slight, sweet lips that kept him so modestly closed. B -b "'Benevolence must also play its role,' Will managed, ignoring him. He drew a deep breath that dragged harshly, his lids falling half-closed and his hips tilting invitingly as Hannibal's tongue traced a wet, leisurely trail over and down the firm shaft of his trapped sex. He lost his train of thought then, clenching hard from the tickling tease of Hannibal's mouth on the sweet spot just below his head, bared so completely by the way he lay spread out on their bed. "'Hannibal!' 
Are you distracted yet? Hannibal asked, curling his tongue around the leaking head of Will's sex to suck it gently up into his mouth, mindful not to pain him with the strange position. Will shuddered hard, and Hannibal stroked his delightful bottom, keeping gentle suction on him as he delved his thumbs back between Will's cheeks. He slid both into the giving heat of Will's tight passage, curling them against the constricting ring of muscle that fluttered desperately for a knot to squeeze. Even the idea of it made him moan, and Will shuddered again, the vibration of it drawing a desperate sound out of him. Hannibal released him with one more deep suck, and lunged up to plunge his tongue between his thumbs, tasting Will deeply, exhaling a soft groan at the way his little mate squirmed and wriggled against him, growing more slick by the second. "'Be above unkindness!' Will gasped, mewling mournfully, when Hannibal retreated. But it quickly changed to a sob of pleasure when Hannibal returned to him, bare and hard and firmly feeding the swollen hot head of his sex into Will's tight and eager body. "'Be above unkindness!' he said, losing the words for a moment as Hannibal sunk inside of him, slow and deep but so gentle. His large, strong hands gripped Will's hips and tipped him for deeper access, holding him there to meet the rocking, deliberate push of Hannibal inside of him. The possession of it brought Will to the shivering cusp of orgasm, every bit of him wanting nothing more than to revel in Hannibal's attention. To bring Hannibal to his knees with pleasure, both of them caught in the tie that would bind them in soul as much as in flesh. "'Be above unkindness and the weakness of belittling others to your own benefit,' Will said, rearing up a little to better feel the heavy thickness spreading him open. Such a tight squeeze that it burned, but it was the burn he gladly cherished, feeling every exquisite inch of Hannibal's wide sex sliding into him, and the brush of his knot as it began to rise. "'But do not hesitate to engage with those who would seek to correct you for ba abandoning one's principles.' Hannibal panted, a ripple of pleasure flooding through him as he arched against Will's solid backside, squeezed to the hilt in giving flesh. He was rapidly overcome by his young mate, lost in the heated grip of his body, wanting nothing more than to endlessly caress his soft skin and cover him in kisses, to feel the yielding push of his taut flesh and hear the soft, throaty sounds of his whimpers mingling with the pleasant timbre of his voice. He took a deep breath and hitched Will's hips up just slightly, just enough to change his angle, and sighed as he sank fully once more into Will's welcoming wet heat. For abandoning one's principles, Will shuddered, losing his place as Hannibal rolled his hips and changed the angle of his rocking thrusts, his swelling knot pressing tightly to Will's wet slit, a teasing promise of even greater pleasures to come. Abandoning one's principles, Hannibal swept one hand over Will's round backside, greedily memorizing the view of him down the slope of his body. He was so achingly gorgeous it was unearthly kind of beauty that found its home in the works of masters, captured in paint and stone to be shared throughout the ages, leaving the world in awe that anyone so magnificent had ever walked this earth. Abandoning one's principles, Will moaned, reciting half from memory now, rapidly unable to keep his focus against the growing pleasure swelling in his body. Hannibal was inside of him, looming over him, touching him, and squeezing him, it was still as overwhelming and exciting as it had been the first time, so much so that Will could hardly bear it. Will inevitably lead to moral decrepitude! The word cracked on a throaty moan as orgasm threatened, tightening his body, squeezing him down around the thick flesh moving within him. Hannibal felt Will's body clutch up, rhythmically clenching, and his breath came out in a harsh gasp. The book fell onto the pillow, forgotten. Will undulated beneath him, sinuous and sleek, and every imaginable perfection he could ever ask for, gasping again in a desperate bid not to lose their bet. M moral decrepitude! His long back rippled, bowed, canting his hips up perfectly, utterly open, utterly ready. The next roll of Hannibal's hips pushed his knot deep, and Will came undone, gripping up around him so hard Hannibal groaned with a pleasure that was almost pain. Ah, moral decrepitude, Will moaned, 
every nerve in his body focused on hannibal inside of him on the pleasure that tripped his words up and scattered his best intentions to leave him writhing on the fat painfully delicious stretch of the knot filling him fit to split him apart his hands clenched the bedding and he half sobbed the intensity of it dragging sounds out of him that were more animal than anything god's will hannibal hissed rocking into him trembling with the need to spill himself but held back by his desire to see will this way unraveling around him caught in a web of pleasure that made him liquid with sensation his gorgeous little mate tipped his hips again straining back on to him and the constriction on his knot was so exquisite that hannibal arched hard in orgasm fingers tight on will's slim hips to draw him closer harder deeper on to him oh god's will how can you be so perfect Animal, will moaned heady urgency in his voice his slender but strong legs folded up then pressing to hannibal's backside and thighs trapping him closest to the first stuttering shudders of will orgasm began hannibal hannibal lunged over him flattening him to the bed tucking up around him in a blanket of flesh and scent until the boundaries of his world started and stopped with the alpha above him the orgasm that shook will's body milked hannibal's own drawing a deeper almost painful pleasure from him as the flood of his seed began will wriggled beneath him hip shifting from side to side teasing and tugging on his knot to please the places within him that craved friction pressure and touches to make it all the sweeter hannibal roused himself enough from his own enjoyment to wedge one hand down beneath will's slick and heated body fingers finding the wet and swollen head of his sex squeezed between the mattress and his firm belly he curled his fingers and took him firmly in hand groaning when will went rigid and breathless in another orgasm gasping harshly and sobbing with the force of it the pulse of his hot seed wetting hannibal's fingers and coverlet beneath with a purr of pure contentment hannibal relaxed into the pull of release bonelessly draped over will's slowly easing body as he poured into him even that was a sensation remade with new pleasures by will's responsive omegan body his knot rhythmically milked the vibration of it encouraging his heavy sack to clutch up and offer more and more of what will's body demanded nearly senseless with the force of it will went limp beneath the weight of hannibal's body the press of hannibal over him thrilled him in ways he still couldn't quite admit to the implicit possessiveness something he would have soundly rejected a handful of months ago now it felt perfectly right to be this way spent and breathless in a tangle with his mate locked together in the prolonged pleasure that made nodding so much more than a biological imperative pleasantly exhausted treasured and protected will purred beneath the pressure of hannibal's heavier body skin tingling with the soft grazing kisses to his nape i suppose you've won will told him adding with a winsome smile oh, i can honestly say i haven't lost by it and i can honestly say hannibal murmured trailing kisses up will's jaw to his round cheek that the words moral decrepitude now have an entirely new meaning for me and just as i will never hold a pen without blushing like a virgin you chose your weapons wisely hannibal i am thoroughly distracted he felt for the book and lifted it but was prevented from closing it when Hannibal took his weight on his elbow and plucked it up. "'I owe Mr. Ballard an expensive thank-you note,' Hannibal said, giving Will a final squeeze before sliding his slick hand from beneath him. He idly wiped his fingers on the bedclothes and propped himself up on both elbows, trying to balance his weight on his knees and arms so as not to entirely flatten his firm little mate beneath him. Will's legs were still folded up behind him, the smooth muscle of his calves pressing against Hannibal's backside— a distracting pressure and display of easy comfort Hannibal still took great delight in. "'You will have to address it to the Capital Center Cemetery,' Will said, drowsy and satiated, reveling in the press of Hannibal's furry belly and chest trapping him against the bed. "'He's been dead some fifty years now.' "'Rather longer than that, by the looks of his writing,' Hannibal remarked, thumbing through the book, balancing on the pillow above Will's disarrayed curls." He tossed the book to one side and eased down atop him again, nibbling the shell of his ear before breathing. Remind me to burn that book before our first child is born. That's rather extreme, Will said, though he understood the sentiment. It is merely a facet of instruction. 
It is a tool for deconstruction, Hannibal said, nuzzling him and relaxing with a sigh. No child of ours will ever need to be anything other than precisely as their nature requires. Even our Omegan child? Will asked, purring when Hannibal coiled tighter against him, wrapping him in strength and heat. If every single one of our four dozen children is Omegan, Hannibal murmured, kissing Will just behind the adorable curve of his ear. Then I will be the richest man in the world five dozen times over. Four dozen? <laughs> will squeaked, breathless laughter escaping him. He reached back and caressed Hannibal's cheek, warning him. I'm not willing to spend the rest of my life in various stages of pregnancy, Hannibal. Thank you very much. We'll be lucky to have even one, all things considered. Oh, I'm already lucky, Hannibal reminded him, clasping Will more tightly to his chest and rolling onto his side, neatly tucking his mate into the curve of his body. And greedy, and an arrogant alpha who expects to have my way at all times. I am confident we'll have a child, Will, and I'm certain we can have as many as you please. Ass, Will breathed, chuckling when Hannibal shifted over him to kiss his lips. His knot pulled and tugged pleasantly as Hannibal worked the covers down, drawing them back up and over their joined, heated bodies. The long day had thoroughly exhausted him, and before Hannibal could even put out the bedside lamp, Will was already asleep. Hannibal curled against him in the darkness and whispered, I love you, Will. His hand slipped to Will's belly and spread just there, beneath his navel, the sweet, fertile flavor of his mate's scent lulling him to sleep. The dinner party and the business with settling their affairs had taken their toll on Roland. He wasn't as capable as he'd been ten or even five years ago, and felt the years of his long life like lead weights on his limbs. He groped into his nightstand, drawing forth the small portrait he'd kept all these years. "'I'm very tired, Charles,' he breathed, rubbing his fingers over the frame. "'You should have told me how tired I would be.' He trailed off, startled from his heavy thoughts by the arrival of Jimmy Price. "'Your Grace, I thought I'd check in before going up,' Jimmy said, coming closer to tuck the blankets around him. He said nothing about the portrait, only took it from Roland's lax fingers and put it back in the drawer where it had come from. "'Can I get you anything to help you sleep?' "'No, Jimmy,' Roland said, shaking his head. "'The old <coughs> of too little time to waste sleeping. We'd rather waste it lamenting the mistakes of our past.' "'Well, that doesn't sound very comforting.' Jimmy said, dimpling up in a smile. I think I'd rather sleep. How is Will? Roland asked, his sinuses burning with the sense memory of Will's changing scent, sugary sweetness with a rich undertone like aged peninsula brandy. Afraid to trust his instincts, I think, Jimmy said, puttering about tidying, always hard at work. But well enough, provided I can get him to eat more than two bites of anything Mrs. Pims makes up. I'll send... <coughs> <laughs> in instructions down regarding his meals, Roland said, gesturing vaguely at him. Please don't let me forget. He needs all the pampering we can give him, Jimmy, as you know well enough. Let me know if anything changes. Of course, Your Grace. I'll just get you some warm milk. What? No, no! Zeller called, letting himself into Roland's suite, still filmed in travel dust, coming in straight from the road. I will get it. No, you just got back. You look terrible, by the way. Go clean yourself up. I'll get him some milk and you can get underfoot tomorrow. I'm here, Zeller said, flinging his saddlebag down on a chair despite Roland's ferocious glower. And when I'm here, I take care of things. Well, Jimmy said, nose tipping into the air. When you're not here, I take care of things, so you're welcome. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. I can handle it, Zeller said, shucking his coat with the same reverence he'd shown the saddlebag. Obviously, Jimmy said, gathering up Zeller's coat with a wrinkle of his nose. Children, Roland scolded, scooting to sit up straighter. Thank you for taking such excellent care of me in Zeller's absence, Jimmy. You may go. Thank you, your grace, Jimmy said, and added with a defiant glare Zeller's way. I'll put the milk on. Thank you, Zeller called, hands on hips and annoyed. Behave yourself. <laughs> Roland said, fumbling his spectacles on as he spoke. You <laughs> rushed in here in quite a state. I expect you found something of interest. You might think so, and I wasn't in a state, Zeller said, digging in his saddlebag. Your kind gets into states, as regular folk don't have that kind of time. 
considering how often I've caught you lazing about taking naps <laughs> when you should have been attending me, Roland said, gesturing for the paper Zeller pulled free. I'll take that with a grain of salt. Here, hand that over. Is this all from Brauner's office? Every bit, Zeller said, giving him the papers before moving to pour himself a glass of water. You stole these? Roland asked, flipping through the pages. No! Well, yeah. Zeller corrected, gesturing with the glass. I stole the originals and hauled up copy and all, and returned the others. That's what took so long. Sorry. Never mind that. You got what I asked for. Lucky for us, Mr. Buttish is here to take these in hand. Zeller gulped the water and followed it with a shot of brandy before he wiped his lips with the back of his hand. Go have something to eat. Take some rest, Zeller. Roland said, stacking the papers and starting from the beginning. I don't... <laughs> I doubt I'll be sleeping any time soon. Zeller mulled it over, watching him carefully, and finally said, Jimmy will be up with your milk, but come morning, we're back on schedule. Roland made an absent, non-committal noise at him, already absorbed in the information he'd been given, but roused himself enough to call after him. Tell Hannibal and Will I... <laughs> I wish to see them first thing tomorrow, and I'm very relieved to see you've returned safely, you brat. Zeller let himself out with a snort of laughter, but Roland was already buried back in the paperwork, relieved to have an excuse not to face his dreams and the memories they contained. Morning found Will up in advance of the sun, without Jimmy's assistance, roused from his sleep by the scent of Mrs. Pym starting the servant's breakfast all the way in the lower levels. His stomach gave a woeful rumble, and Hannibal answered it in his sleep, purring against Will's nape and squeezing him close. The door cracked just enough for a shadow in the lesser darkness of the hall to whisper, Winston, come. The dog lifted his head and Will sat up, holding the rumpled covers to his chest to whisper, I'll take him, Mr. Berger. Oh, sorry, my lord. Didn't mean to wake you. Berger said, quietly horrified. You didn't, Will said, groping for his robe and dragging it on in the darkness, his toes seeking out the slippers he'd discarded next to the bed. Go have your breakfast. I'll see to Winston. Yes, my lord. Berger said, closing the door with a soft click. Will moved to stand, but felt a little light-headed, and eased down to sit on the side of the bed, rubbing his temple. Winston wiggled up closer and put his muzzle in Will's lap, whining softly until Will stroked his ears, whispering, I'm okay, Winston, I'm fine. It passed after a moment, and Will chided himself that he must find an appetite soon, if this was any indication of his health. But the thought quickly vanished as he cleaned up and got ready for the day. He had more than Winston's walk in mind in those pre-dawn hours. Aunt Aldana had planted a seed that Jimmy's pointed remarks had thoroughly watered, and Will Lecter Graham found himself in dire need of answers one way or another. Rather than raise Hannibal's hopes for no reason, he opted for the next best thing, the Hartford Library. After a soothing dawnlit stroll with Winston, his pistol, and no less than five of the hired guards Hannibal insisted on keeping at hand— Will returned to the library with a murmured request for Mr. Hawks to bring him a tray, if it wasn't too much trouble. The lector library was vast, organized by necessity and regularly tended to by a librarian, but Will knew it well enough. He'd spent many a long winter reading away the snowbound hours, but he'd never ventured into any Omegan studies of any kind until now. Winston flopped before the fire, pleasantly tired from their walk, keeping one eye on Will as he settled with his book. He was dismayed to find it rather out of date and possibly not accurate, but it was certainly better than nothing, and he thumbed through the index to find the section he needed. Will read quietly, eating the small breakfast Mr. Hawks brought him in thoughtful, absorbed silence. It was porridge, thickened with honey and goat's milk, accompanying a tempting variety of bland fruits, peeled and cut, along with one small cup of coffee and a large pot of tea. Will ate every bit of the porridge, hungrier than he'd expected and craving the sweetness, abandoning the bitter coffee after only a few swallows for the sweetened tea. He lowered his cup, considering the changes he'd been experiencing and what he'd attributed them to. He was so lost in reflecting on what he'd learned from that old medical text that it took him entirely by surprise when Hannibal entered the library unannounced, calling, Ah, Hawk said you were here. They're preparing to leave, are you? What is that? Nothing, Will said, sliding the book from his lap and down by his side. He placed his cup back into its saucer, realizing Hannibal noticed how he trembled. He bit his lip against his desire to confess himself, 
to compare Hannibal's knowledge against his own and see what his husband made of it. But now certainly wasn't the time. I'm coming. I hope you haven't gone and rescued Mr. Ballard, Hannibal said, his sharp, curious eyes searching for the title as Will reshelved the book, but he was unable to make out the script. No, nothing of the sort, Will said, approaching him with Winston at his side. His soft, affronted yelp was smothered in a brief kiss, and he scolded. Hannibal, I've just eaten. And you still taste just as sweet. Hannibal praised him. He pulled back with one hand, still cupping Will's face, his smile falling with quizzical concern. Are you unwell, Will? Will gazed into his eyes, the words straining to burst from his lips, yearning for confirmation of his suspicions. No, he said swallowing it back like a secret, needing it to be just his own for a little while longer. But his smile was wide and happy as he said, Everything is wonderful, Hannibal. Everything is perfectly wonderful. <laughs>